Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today on our webinar on the Cisco Catalyst 3850 switch. Uh, we'd like to welcome our Cisco presenter today, Nitin Chopra. Uh, thank you for joining us, Nitin, on, on today's webinar series. We're glad to have you there. Pleasure is all mine. So, folks, uh, if anyone has any questions uh, for Nitin, there's a Q&A box that you can just enter your question, and if you don't see it on your screen, it's, you can just, it's in the drop down up above where you, the down button, just click on that and open up the Q&A screen, and we'll be happy to answer your questions at the end of this webinar. So my name is Ray Hidoko. I'm the marketing uh, director for here for Action Pack Networks, and we'd like to talk about the introduction of the Cisco Catalyst 3850, which, which was introduced in January of this year. Uh, Mr. Chopra will talk about the features um, and the capabilities, as well as the architecture for the 3850, so I hope you folks will find the information useful. So um, Nitin is a 10-year Cisco veteran. Um, he's uh, led in areas such as you know, switching, routing, WAS, and security, as well as advanced technologies. So like I said earlier, we're, we're happy that Nitin is joining us here today. So without further ado, um, maybe we can just hand it over to Mr. Chopra. To some good morning, to some good afternoon, and to some good evening. My name is Nitin Chopra, and I'm a part of Unified Access Group and a worker of U.S. focusing on Catalyst 4500 and Catalyst 3850 switch. So as Ray pointed out, you know, 3850 was launched in January this year in Cisco Live. So today we are going to discuss entirely on Catalyst 3850. So this is the agenda that we're going to discuss on. So first I'm going to take you through the new jargon of Cisco, which is one policy, one management, and one network. Then I'm going to discuss something on Catalyst 3850 architecture. And then I'm going to take you through the Cisco converged unified wireless network that how do you deploy wireless as is today. And after you deploy 3850, what are the differences you would see in your network? So before I start on 3850, you know, I would like to discuss something on the mega trends that all the enterprise segments are seeing in the user workspace. You know, the, many of you would have been discussing about BYOD. That's, the, you know, one of the major mega trends that we are also seeing in our customer networks. So when you, you know, when you say BYOD, what does BYOD mean? You know, in, in simple words, it's just that a user, a employee of your organization wants to bring in his own personal wireless device. So if that's good, you know, that's a nice idea that, you know, he brings his own device, he works on it. But how do you make sure that the access that he gets is secured enough that he does not take out the information of your enterprise network or your organization out in the public? And in BYOD, the second mega trend that we are seeing is guest access. You know, a lot of guests comes into your organization or the enterprise network, they would also like to have internet access. Now, when you say, you know, when you, people bring in their own devices, obviously they would like to be mobile, you know, they would like to have a seamless roaming kind of a thing, they, they would like to roam across the enterprise network, they would like to have the seamless access, and they would also like to have the performance over those devices. Now, these are two mega trends, but if you look at the third mega trend, that is again correlated with both of these mega trends. That is video. Now, when they have wireless mobile devices, they would also love to run video over it. So how do you ensure that you have optimal or maybe, you know, uh, optimal multicast streaming over your network? And, you know, today, you know, you have FaceTime over iPad, you have other applications over Android wherein you can do video conferencing, and people are working on, you know, cloud-based services wherein you can interoperate between uh, enterprise uh, video conferencing services with the, you know, public available services on the net. Again, from the IT side, if you look at it, you know, the only agenda that IT has is to deliver an uncompromised user experience on any workspace. Now, this is where I, I'll be talking about the wireless evolution. So let's go back somewhere around five years. And five years back, wireless was kind of a good to have or maybe, you know, kind of a technology in the enterprise network. Access point were used as a hotspot only. But if you if you if you just start climbing these stairs, you know, as of today, it's a necessity to have 
in any of the networks. So if you're designing an enterprise network, if wireless is not there, that network is not complete. So if you look at today, you know, there are devices which are wireless capable, which are doing kind of a VXI services. And if you look at it, you know, people are talking about 90.99.99% uptime on wireless services. So now this is what Cisco has been, you know, talking about a lot, and we have been working intensively on these three, uh, you know, spaces. The first, first is one policy. So when we say one policy, you know, if you if you look at the, uh, you know, management suites for security available in the market and from Cisco, there are a couple of them. But what we are trying to do is to, you know, merge them all together and give you one suite only. So as of today, we have Cisco ICE, which does the entire security policing of your network. Maybe it's wired or wireless. You can configure all security policies through one, through Cisco IT itself. The second box is one management. So when we say one management, if you again look at today's uh, you know suites availability from Cisco, there are a couple of suites which does the management for your wired and wireless. So it's it's kind of an overlay over each other. Now what we have done is we have come up with Cisco Prime 2.0, uh, wherein you can actually go ahead and do, you know, you can do configuration or troubleshooting of your both wired and wireless network to a single console. And the third box is one network. So when we say one network, now we are planning to converge both wired and wireless on the platforms that we're going to come up with. So the, for an example, today we have Catalyst 3850, wherein you have both wired and wireless capabilities built onto the single switch. So for today, we are only going to talk about Catalyst 3850, which delivers converged wired and wireless to an enterprise organization. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, every one of you would correlate with. This is a, a normal enterprise network topology. So if you look at, at the bottom of the screen on the right hand side, you have, you know, a couple of management suites for wireless, for LAN, and you also have certain security suites which are managing security for your network. So first thing that we did was to merge all of them into two suites only. So one policy is Cisco ICE, as, I was, as I've told you earlier, and one management is Cisco is through Cisco Prime. Now, if you look at, at the left-hand side of the screen, you know, you have a couple of, you know, clients out there which could be wireless and wired, those are wireless clients are connecting to the Cisco access point and wired clients are going to the catalyst switch. Now, if you look at your net, uh, at this particular network, you can see there's an overlay of wireless network over the wired network. Now, what you have to do is you have to manage two different pieces in a single network. One, you have to manage the wireless part. The second one you have to manage is the wired part. So you have two different policies to manage. Now, what we did was we merged them together. We said, this is not the way to go. Let's converge them, and, and we came out with Catalyst 3850 switch. Now, Catalyst 3850 switch has an integrated wireless controller, now, which means now the CapWrap tunnel from the directly connected access points on 3850 terminates at 3850 level only. So I'm going to talk about the benefits of terminating the CapWrap tunnel to 3850 in my upcoming slides. So this is just to let you know that we have converged both wired and wireless with Catalyst 3850 switch. Now again, Catalyst 3850 switch has certain constraints in the number of access points can be terminated on it. But if you're looking for a higher requirement, there's a new wireless WLAN controller, which is, which is 5760, which has the same hardware as well as the iOS, which is running on Catalyst 3850. With 5760 WLAN controller, you can scale beyond 250 access points or 16,000 clients within a mobility domain. Now, the beauty of 5760 is that, as I told you earlier, it has exactly the same hardware. The fascia might be different, but the I'm talking about the internal hardware in terms of the ASICs and the CPU. It's exactly the same. The iOS commands and everything is exactly the same as 3850. So this controller comes is, is not running on Air OS a, anymore. It has the same iOS what we have on 3850. So it's the iOS XE I'm going to talk about. Now this is what a 3850 looks like. So in 3850 we have two flavors. One is 24 port and the second one is 48 port. So if you look at the capabilities, uh, 24 port comes with one UADP ASIC, which is Unified Access Data Plane ASIC. So this is the new ASIC uh, from Cisco. It has been designed in home by Cisco. This does maximum of the job for the switch itself. 
So you know it takes the job and it doesn't let the CPU overload uh, and all the hardware configs are done onto it. 48 port comes with two UADP A6. So there's a performance difference on both the switches, which is because it's 48 port has two UADP and 24 port has one UADP A6. Now if you look at the feature sets which are mentioned on the screen, I would like to point out certain of those, you know, for an example, both 24 port and 48 port, if you stack them, you know, as of today you can only stack four port, uh, four switches together. But with an upcoming release somewhere in September and October, you will be able to stack somewhere around nine switches. So if you stack switches together, it can give you 480 GB per stacking bandwidth. Now if we talk about the wireless capabilities, 48 port can deliver 40 gig of wireless throughput and 24 port is 20 gig. Again, the difference is because of the UADP A6 that we have there. Now on a stack of 3850 switch, you can terminate somewhere around 50 access points and it can render to up somewhere around to 2,000 clients. Now all the switches comes with full PoE, uh, PoE plus support. All the ports on the switch are line rate. So it also has stack power and fan, FRU fans and power supplies are field replaceable. So these are some of the points that I wanted to highlight to you guys. Now let's look at into the uplink modules. You know, we've been receiving a lot of, you know, information from the field. Now with 3850, we have come up with four into 10 gig network uplink modules. Now the first module that you see on the screen, which is on the left hand side, is four into 10 gig. This can interoperate as four into one gig as well. Now this particular uplink module is only supported on 48 port. Now the reason behind uh, this particular port only being supported on 48 port is again the UADP A6 that we have because we wanted to deliver a line rate. Now to deliver line rate for four, all 4 into 10 gigs, we need two UADP A6. That's why it is only supported on 48 port. Now if you look at the second uplink module that is 4 into 1 gig, now this is supported on both 24 port as well as in 48 ports switch. The third one is 2 into 10 gig. Again, this is supported on 24 port and 48 port uh, switches. Now let's look at something onto the power supplies. Okay, one good news, if you've been using a lot of 3750X in your network, the power supplies are compatible with 3850s. So if you have a lot of spare power supplies lying with you, those power supplies can be reused with 3850 switches. But if you're ordering 3850E new switches, the PID of these power supply may differ from the 3750X. Uh, PID means product identification code. The reason is only for tracking purpose. Now if you look at the power supplies, again, we have four flavors starting from 350 watt AC to 1100 watt AC. And then we have a DC power supply as well. Uh, you know, if you want to have full POE support, obviously you need to have two power supplies. And both power supplies are one plus one in plus one into one plus one redundant. Now, this is a major change from 3750X. This is the IOS XC evolution that I wanted to introduce you guys with. You know, if you look at 3750X, it has been running on a monolithic IOS, which had all the components in there. But the major constraint was it could not work on a dual core CPU. It was only using one core of the CPU. Now with 3850 what we have done is we have taken all these modules and we have put them as an individual process over the Linux architecture. We have we have the IOS daemon again running on the Linux architecture which controls all these individual processes. Now why did we go ahead with Linux architecture? Is The reason is that we wanted this particular IOS to be faster than in comparison to the 3750X. With Linux architecture, what we can do is we can actually harness the power of all the cores of the CPU. So 3850 comes with a quad core CPU. So with Linux architecture, we can actually utilize or utilize all the cores of that particular CPU. Another beauty is that with Linux architecture, now we can host applications over this particular IOS. So the first application that we have hosted is the wireless control module which is actually running as an individual process over this iOS XE. Uh, the next application that we are going to host is Wireshark, which was a big hit in 4500. So same way, we'll be hosting a application, the same application over 3850 as well. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're concerned 
that does it changes the look and feel of the iOS? The answer is no. The touch and feel, the command line, everything remains exactly the same that you guys have been using for the last 20 years. So that's the beauty of iOS XE. Now let's look at, you know, what was the reason of merging both wired and wireless? The reason was, you know, uh, we've been hearing a lot from our customers, they wanted to have control from a single GUI or maybe through a single switch for both wired and wireless. So what we did was, we, you know, we married both wired and wireless and the output has been 3850. So if you look at the wireless features that we have, all these wireless features are available on 3850 as of today. And if you look at the wired features, which has been a strong point for Cisco, again, all these features are available on 3850 as of now. The features that you see with asterisk uh, will be available with the uh, you know newer iOS release in future. So we have a, a release coming up in April, which would be able to deliver certain of these features. And by September and October, we will be in full parity with all the features that we had on 3750X as well as on the wireless part. Now, when we merge both of these wired and wireless together on a 3850, so it eliminates the operational complexity. Now you have only a single point to manage both wired and wireless at the access layer. So I'm going to explain it. How do you manage? What are the complexities that you guys are seeing as of today? And how are those complexities eliminated with 3850? Now, the beauty is that with 3850, you get a single iOS for both wired and wireless. So when you're upgrading this iOS, you're actually upgrading both the services together. Now let's look at something onto the flexible net flow. So you know this has been a major discussion on 3750X. So with 3850, you need not to buy any external modules. Flexible net flow comes natively onto the 3850 hardware. So this is the first point that I wanted to highlight. The second point is that with 3850 and FNF, you can now go ahead and monitor the wireless part as well. So now you have the visibility of the wireless network at the access layer. Now when you have the directly connected access point capped at term terminating at 3850, which means that the entire encryption of the access point is terminating at 3850, 3850 can sense what is happening on the wireless world with FNF. Now with 3850 you can have both egress and egress policies of FNF, FNF on each and every port of the switch. Now there is no special licensing for, to enable FNF on 3850. The only thing that you need, guys need to have is the IP-based iOS licensing on 3850, which would enable flexible net flow on the 3850 switch on all the ports. Now let's look at something onto the QS as well. Now QS has changed from 3750X. Now what we have done is we have come out with NQC based uh, QS on the 3850. This is in parity with ISR routers that Cisco offers as well as 4500 switches that we have in our portfolio. Now again, we still have the same uh, you know, quality of service for queuing, policing, shaping, and marking. But the added benefits that you get with 3850 is that you can go ahead and deploy QS based onto the per access point, per radio, per SSID or per client. So this is available as of today. This was launched at FCS on these features. So you can go ahead and deploy QS based onto these four different subsets. And if you again, you know, look at the new QS features that we have is the, the first one that I wanted to highlight was hierarchical bandwidth management. So I'm going to discuss this in the upcoming slide. Uh, then again, the second one is approximate fair drop. So I'm going to discuss this again in the next slide. And then you can, the third one I wanted to discuss was per user, per application level policy and marking in the software roadmap. So this is there, this should be launched by December or October, wherein you can go ahead and put quality of service based on to the per user or per application. And the third point, uh, third thing I wanted to highlight was the queuing numbers, the queues number that we have on 3850. So if you compare this with 3750X, they are way, way high. So the first thing I wanted to highlight was the queues for wide traffic. For 3850, we have eight queues per port uh, for wide traffic. If you go back to 3750X, there were somewhere around 
four queues per port. Now, if you look at uh, the queues for wireless traffic, we have four queues per port. Now, you guys might ask me a question that why do we have less queues for wireless traffic? Now, this number has to be matched with the numbers that we have on the Cisco access point. So as of today, Cisco access point only supports four queues per port. So as soon as, soon as you hook up uh, access point to a 3850 switch, that particular port is allocated with four queues per port. And if you again look at the buffer numbers, they are way, way high in comparison to 3750X. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that it has 12 MB buffer size for quality of service on 48 port. So again, for 24 port, this just goes half, which is 6 MB. Now, if we talk about security, we have done a lot of enhancement on security part as well on 3850. So if you look at uh, some of the session aware networking uh, protocols that we have on 3850, these are kind of similar to 3750X, but we have launched certain new things as well. So I wanted to highlight one of those was MAC-based VLANs. Now what you can do is, based on the MAC addresses, you can automatically assign a VLAN to a particular machine. So the most used cases that we have seen till now is that a particular machine running a VM instance. So for an example, if you have a physical machine which is running a VM instance, based on the MAC address of both the machines, both of those devices can be assigned with a different VLAN onto the switch itself. So uh, that is one of the beauties that we have, uh, we have on 3850 switch. If you look at the wired part of the security portfolio or the wireless part of the security portfolio, we have we are supporting maximum of the protocols as of today. Uh, one of the uh, good features of 3850 is onboarding of devices. So for an example, if a user comes in with an iPad or maybe an iPhone or maybe with an Android device, based on the device type, 3850 with eyes can go ahead and deploy policies, uh, you know, which are designed for that particular device type. So that is again one of the uh, BYOD functionality that we're going to launch in April. So uh, TrustSec, MacSec, and Device Sensor uh, feature set will be launched in October and December if you're looking at them. Now this is where I wanted to discuss something onto the video part of the uh, you know mega trends that we were discussing before. Now, how do you ensure that with 3850 you get you know reliable multicast deployment? So if you look at the current multicast deployment or how does the multicast replication happens in a network, so I'm going to take you through that scenario first. So you have a, a normal topology wherein you have a core distribution and access. You have a multicast server which is somewhere in the data center. Now for the replication of that particular multicast stream as of today for both wired and wireless happens at two different parts. So for the wireless, the replication of the wireless multicast stream happens at the WLAN controller. And for the wired part, the replication of that particular stream happens at the switches, which could be an access switch or the distribution switch based onto the design that you guys have. But with 3850, we have changed this scenario. Now if you look at 3850, the multicast replication happens for both wired and wireless at the Catalyst 3850 switch itself. That's one of the beauty. The second beauty is that if you connect, for example, if you have connected an access point or maybe an IP phone to the 3850, 3850 is that intelligent that it will not replicate that particular stream to those particular ports as it understands that these particular streams are not required by the access point or by the IP phones. If you go back to the 3750X scenarios, 3750X used to broadcast or you know, it used to unicast that particular multicast stream to all the ports which were subscri subscribed to that particular particular multicast group. It could be an IP phone or an uh, you know access point as well. So this is uh, the you know optimized multicast streamings that we have been doing on 3850s for a, from a January. So this feature is available at FCS. Now let's look at something onto the hierarchical bandwidth management and fair sharing that I was talking about in my QS slide. So uh, this has been a scenario with many of the enterprise network wherein they've been facing this challenge. Uh, every enterprise network provides guest access as well as the same access point provides the enterprise access as well. Now what happens is that if you, if any of the enterprise network has a you know seminar within a lot of num 
high number of guest access is happening or maybe high number of guests are available. What they do is they normally hog the bandwidth from that particular network which, you know, sort of makes the enterprise network suffer. So for example, there's a, lar a large number of guests coming in, they will definitely hog the entire bandwidth and enterprise users will not be able to take that much of share. Now with deterministic SSID bandwidth, what you can do is you can actually go ahead and allocate a certain percentage of that particular bandwidth to the SSIDs. Now the difference will be if there are a num large number of guests coming in, they'll be still playing within that particular percentage of bandwidth allocated to them and they will not be able to hog the enterprise bandwidth. So this feature has been tested and has been running successfully with many of our customers as of today. The second, uh, you know, bandwidth management tool that I wanted to discuss with you guys was fair sharing. So before I, you know, get into fair sharing, I just wanted to highlight that this particular feature is enabled on the hardware and this cannot be edited or this cannot be disabled. So it's just there and, uh, you know, uh, the switch has been designed in that particular way only. Now what happens with this particular feature is that you know, uh, there could be a user who is a heavy hitter or maybe he is hogging the entire bandwidth because he is downloading some kind of a file or maybe he is running a bit torrent on a network. Now, if there are new enterprise users joining in that particular uh, access point of the network, they may not be able to get their fair share of bandwidth. So, but with this particular feature which is enabled on, on hardware, what, it, what this particular feature does it, it actually takes that much share from the heavy hitter and gives it to the new users who are joining in on to that particular network. So, you know, it goes and hits the heavy hitter instead of hitting the enterprise users. So this is, as I told you, this feature is already enabled. We cannot disable it. It's just there on the switch itself. Now, this is a proof, you know, I, I wanted to show you this personally to you guys that, you know, uh, we've been talking about the, the touch and feel and the iOS commands remain exactly the same. So this is the command line or these are the group of commands which I've configured on a switch uh, for an SSID named Reaper. So there are certain new commands. Yes, I do agree there are certain new commands on 3850 for the wireless world. But if you go th through these commands, these are exactly the same which are used for wired world. So out here I'm trying to configure a SSID named Reaper. So if you look at the first command which says WLAN Reaper number two Reaper, the first Reaper is the name of the network. The second uh, two, the number two is the identifier for that particular WLAN. And the second Reaper which says is the SSID which would be broadcasted over the wireless. Now if you, if you look at the Netflow commands, these are exactly the same what we configure on the wired part of 3850. So what we tried doing was to keep the wireless command exactly the same to introduce certain new commands for wireless which were never there on AOS. But these commands are again exactly the same. So you go to the configure terminal, you start configuring these commands, you will be able to configure wireless within minutes. So if you look at the flexible net flow commands, it's exactly the same that we have on the wired world. If you look at the QS application on SSID for both egress and egress, it remains exactly the same that we have on 3850. In the same way, for QS application for clients on SSID, is again the same. And if you look at the access list, it's again the same that we configure on the wired world. Now, this is a slide uh, which I wanted to show you guys to let you know that the investment that you're going to, are going to make on 3850 is future proofed. So if you look at on the uh, left hand side of the screen wherein we have a campus environment, somewhere around 3,840 3, users, the number of 3850 switches are 80. Now how much wireless bandwidth you can scale up to? So when I said uh, in the first second slide that uh, each switch can deliver somewhere around 40 gig on each switch 48 port. So if you have 80 number of switches, it can render somewhere around 3.2 terabytes of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Now if you look at on the right hand side screen wherein you have a small campus or a branch environment, uh, the number of users are somewhere around 192 and the total number of switches are 4. It can render to you somewhere around 160 Gbps of wireless bandwidth. Now many of you might ask that why such a high capacity of wireless bandwidth. So just to tell you, uh, 
down the line in another year, uh, we are looking at 802.11ac, uh, IEEE standard for wireless. And the same IEEE standard has been launched onto the uh, wireless uh, phones as well. For an example, Galaxy S4 from Samsung uh, has 802.11ac capabilities. So whatever investment uh, customers are making as of today or you guys are going to make today is future-proofed to scale up to 802.11ac. Now let's look at something onto the resiliency part of 3850. So we've been talking a lot onto the 3850 features uh, on the software side. Now let's look at what difference does it brings onto the resiliency and HA over 3850. So this is again totally different from 3750X. You know, uh, let's let's look at this particular scenario. So you have four pillars. Let's assume that each pillar is a 24 port a 3850 switch. Now when you stack four switches together, it gives you six rings in total. So three rings goes to east, three rings goes to west. Each ring is somewhere around 40 GBPS, which gives you 240 GBPS of uh, stacking bandwidth. And with the spatial reuse, which enables multipath parallel switching across each stack ring, that doubles the throughput to 480 GBPS of bandwidth on the stack. Packets transmitted between these switches are broken into segments. Those segments travel in both the direction across the ring. So for deterministic control plane operation with stack, within stack-wise 480, it is recommended to adjust switch priorities from default value. And this can be done through the exit command mode. So this is the beauty of 3850. Now with 3850, what we have done is we have come out with stateable switch over uh, mechanism over the stack. So I'm going to discuss this in my upcoming slide that how does it differs from the 3750X. So this slide was just to introduce you guys that how do we render 480 GPS of uh, stacking bandwidth to you. And uh, one point that I wanted to highlight here was that as the technology and the switches are totally different, 3850 stack is not compatible or backward compatible with 3750X uh, stacking architecture. So if you want to stack a 3750X switch with 3850, that is not possible. And uh, the other point was, uh, if you're going to stack the 3850 switches together, which is four switches together as of today, they all need to be on the same license level. Uh, it's not like 3750X wherein you have a different license level, still they can become a part of stack, but but for 3850, it has to be the same IOS label licensing. Now, these are certain comparison numbers with 3750X uh, that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, you know, on the stacking bandwidth, uplink, MAC addresses, unicast routes, and everything. So if you compare with compare 3750X with 3850, the numbers are really high. And this is just to ensure that whatever the future requirements are, 3850 is ready to deliver those uh, you know requirements. Now again, uh, based on the uh, stacking architecture, the only difference as of today that I can see is that the number of switches on 3750X, which is nine, and for 3850 switches as of today, where we are standing is only four, but with an October release, that will be increased to nine again. Now, before I go ahead and discuss on 3850 stacking architecture, you know, I would like to step back and discuss something onto the 3750X stack-wise plus architecture. So the first point that I wanted to highlight was 64 GBPS of stacking throughput. Uh, it supports nine members of stack. Now, if you guys are very, you know, must be very familiar with 3750X architecture. So 3750X stacking architecture used to have a master and all the other switches were kind of potential master or member switch in that particular stack. If you look at the control plane of 3750X, the L2 and STP are distributed across the members, and the entire L3 information and CDP information is centralized. If you look at the data plane, it is again distributed L2 forwarding and centralized L3 forwarding. If you look at the control plane redundancy, it was NS, NS21. And as I highlighted before, it supports mixed licenses in the stack. Now, if you look at 3850, so it is totally different from 3750X. The first point I wanted to highlight was it, is, it has 480 gig of stacking throughput. So I told you that you know it has six rings, and how do we achieve 480 GBPS? 
Now again I told you it supports four member stack as of today. Nine member stack will be in the next release. Now this is third is the major difference. Now what we did was we moved out of uh, master and potential master or member concept and we said okay let's change the stacking architecture and we came out with active and standby. So what it does it, it supports SSO NSF so you know state will switch over so if you have the active switch so when you boot up this, uh, you know, the switches in a stack, the lowest uh, MAC uh, becomes the active switch and consecutively the other switches takes up as standby and members. Now if you look at the control plane, you know, the MAC learning, FTP, L3 and CDP are centralized and they are in state sync with the standby. So for an example, if the active switch does the MAC learning, STP, L3 and CDP and it synchronizes all this information live with the standby switches. If you look at the data plane, it is again distributed L2 and L3 forwarding. If you look at the control plane redundancy, it is one is to one. So the beauty is that, you know, when the active switch synchronizes the entire information with the standby switch, in case the active goes down, uh, this is this has been tested in lab and this, is, uh, this has been tested uh, with a customer as well in his live environment and as per the customer comments, uh, you know, he told us that he did not see any traffic drop or any packet drop when the, uh, you know, switchover happened from the active to the standby switch. And when we tested in our labs, uh, we could only see one ping out and the entire information started from the standby switch. So this is one of the beauty of 3850 switch. Now this is where I compare a 3850 switch stacking architecture with a Catalyst 6500. So as I told you, the active and the standby member switches run the entire IOS daemon and the wireless control module. So what happens is they synchronize the information uh, live with each other and all the other member switches uh, are act as a member switch. So as I told you, the data plane again L2 and L3 are distributed what member switches does it, it locally switches the traffic uh, for the same VLAN or a different VLAN. Now the beauty is that it doesn't go to the active switch at all. Now the same thing happens on a 6500 switch as well, wherein you have an active standby supervisor synchronizing the entire information with each other and the other modules has the DFC and the capability to locally switch the traffic uh, without sending it to the active supervisor. So this is where we compare a 3850 switch with a 6500 saying that you know, it has the same or the similar architecture of active and standby supervisor. Now this is what a stack-wise 480, the stacking cable of 3850 looks like. This is again one of the you know, uh, reason that it cannot stack with 3750X switch. So it has a different connector interface and this again comes into three variants starting from 0 0.5 meters, 1 meter and 3 meters. Now let's look at a scenario wherein you have a stack, stack of 3850 switch and what all you processes are in you know things you can run on 3850. The first thing is that you can run 3850 purely as a wired switch, wired L3 switch. Don't enable any wireless management commands onto 3850 switch. It will act as a same wired switch as you have like a 3750X. The second mode you can run a 3850 switch is an MA mode, which is mobility agent. So these processes might sound new to you guys, but these processes do exist as of today in the WLAN controller, but they were never talked about because they were singly handled by, handled by the WLAN controller and there was no need to discuss about these because these were just a process running in the WLAN controller itself. Now with 3850, uh, what we have done is we have distributed these processes so that the cap up tunnels uh, termination and you know policy deployment can happen at the d850 level so this is where uh, what we have done is we have taken that process from wlan controller and said okay let's run this process as well on 3850 now ma as i told you is a mobility agent now this particular process terminates the cap wrap tunnel from the access points so this is the point wherein you can actually see the wireless traffic on the wired world. The second process is MC, which is the mobility controller. So mobility controller is the process which runs the entire suite of WLAN controller. 
So it does the mobility stuff for you. It does the licensing, access point licensing for you. It also provides the guest access through the guest anchor. So uh, these are the three different modes that you can run on 3850 switch or maybe a stack. The first one is exactly the same as wired switch. Don't enable any wireless configuration. It will act as a wired switch only. Second is MA. Third is MC. And if you have a smaller deployment, you can actually run both MC and MA processes on a stack of switch or maybe on a single switch itself. So both can coexist on the same switch. So <clears throat> this is where I wanted to highlight that you know you have a single platform for both wired and wireless. You have a common iOS, same point of administration and one release. So if you're planning to deploy wireless in your network or if you've already deployed wireless on your network, with 3850 you will only have single point of management for both quality of service and security policy. So this is where the single platform has been launched. The second uh, thing I want block I wanted to discuss was the network wide visibility. So now when you have flexible net flow giving you the entire information or the information of the flows happening on the wireless and the wired world, you have the visibility of the wireless network as well that who's utilizing what, who's using how much bandwidth, and you can go ahead and deploy quality of service based on to the access point, clients, radio, or maybe applications. Then you have the consistent security and quality of service control. So you have hierarchical bandwidth management, and you have distributed policy enforcement. So you can actually go ahead and control bandwidth based on to the SSIDs. You can go ahead and put quality of service again, so, and you have the similar commands for both wired and wireless world. Mm. Then you have the maximum resiliency with stateful switchover recovery. So when I was talking about uh, NSF, SSO, onto the stacking architecture, uh, the active standby scenarios, you have the maximum resiliency with 3850 switch. So uh, if you compare to 3750X, it was somewhere around 500 milliseconds for master and the potential master to take over. With 3850, we have brought it down to somewhere around 6 milliseconds or two milliseconds, depending on to your network design. And the third one is scale with distributed wired and wireless data plane. So again, if you look at the 480 gig of stack bandwidth, or maybe if you look at 40 gig of wireless bandwidth, this is future proofed, and all your protection investment is protected with the future technologies getting launched in the next couple of years. So uh, till now, I've been talking about the architecture feature sets of 3850. Now let's hop on to the wireless deployment, that uh, how does the current wireless deployment happens in an enterprise network, and then I'll be taking you through the 3850 installation and the terminologies and building blocks. So let's look at something onto the architecture which is there as of today. So this is again, uh, you know, three layer architecture wherein you have a core, you have a distribution, you have access. You have a WLC somewhere in the core of your network. You have access point directly connected to the access layer of access switches in the access layer. You have certain clients connected to that particular access point. And you have the entire CAFR tunnels from individual access points going and terminating at the WLC level. So which means that if you want to have any visibility of wireless network at the access layer, you cannot have it with current deployment because the entire CAPREP tunnel which is encrypted is getting decrypted at the WLC level at the core of your network. So just going to use certain legends here so that you can easily understand what color means what. Now you have again a redundant WLC in your network. You have formed a mobility group between these two multiple, these two WLCs. You have an intercontroller controller uh, tunnel be, uh, between these two controllers. So, you know, this is a network wherein you also have WLAN guest anchor, which goes through the WLC, which is running the MA and MC process. So if you look at this particular network, you know, this is well-proven network, and everyone is sure that it works without a glitch, and this has been working for a longer time and you know uh, for many years. Now if you look at the processes that I was talking about, the MC and an MA process, see both MC and MA process as of today exist onto the WLC level. So as I told you earlier, MA is where the capital tunnel terminates from the access point 
and mobility controller is where you handle the roaming part of the uh, uh, clients as well as you do a resource uh, radio resource management vips licensing and guest access now let's look at something on to the traffic flows that you guys have on the current wireless deployment architecture so out here i'm going to depict an example wherein you have the wlan controller in the core of your network and you have a wireless ip phone which is trying to make a call to a wired ip phone connected to the same switch so the access point is connected on the same switch where the uh, wired ip phone is and a wireless ip phone is trying to make a call to that particular wired ip phone now if you look at that this particular scenario the entire wireless traffic has to go through the wlan controller at the data center level and from there it gets into the wired world so for a simple communication which which is supposed to happen over the same switch is now taking somewhere around nine hops and this is one of the uh, examples wherein i'm just trying to make a wireless call to a wired phone but the same scenario exists for a call which would be between wireless to wireless as well so for an example if uh, if two wireless ip phones are trying to make a call to each other connected onto the same ap still the entire traffic has to go through the core uh, layer of the network and then come back to the wireless world this is one of the major constraint that we saw and the second constraint was that you have to maintain two different policies for both wired and wireless world at two different points so the entire qs policy the security policies for the wireless world were applied at the wlc level at the data center and for the wired world the entire policies were applied at the switch at the access layer now let's look at the same example with 3850 so when you deploy the 3850 how does it change the scenario but before that you know i would like to take you through certain of the building blocks or the entities that we have introduced with 3850 so there are certain physical entities and there are certain logical entities so the first physical entity uh, is exactly the same that we had in the current world which is mobility agent where the cap web tunnel terminates then we have the mobility controller which manages mobility within or across the sub domain does rrm webs uh, yeah, and you know guest access and the licensing for the access point with 3850 we have launched a new physical entity which is mobility oracle so what this does it it is just a super set of mc and it allows a scalable mobility management within a domain so i'm going to explain it in my next slide that where does mobility oracle you know fits in just to highlight out here itself mobility oracle is an optional item uh, it's not necessary to be deployed in any of the wireless network with 3850 so it's it's an option that if you want to go ahead with this uh, you can now let's look at something on to the logical entities so again mobility groups which is exactly the same what we have in the current world it is just a grouping of mobility controllers and it enables fast roaming within that particular mobility group and one of the controller within that particular mobility group does radio resource management for the entire multiple mcs within that particular mobility group itself now we have mobility domain it is exactly the same what we have in the current wireless world it is grouping of mcs to support seamless roaming so for example there is a client who is actually roaming from one wlc controller to another wlc controller within same mobility domain it will be a seamless roam and the client need not to reauth or re dhcp now the third logical entity that we have launched with 3850 is switch peer group uh the switch peer group actually localizes traffic for roam with a known distribution block so what you can do is you can actually you know make a group of multiple 3850s and form a switch peer group so this is just a software configuration uh you give three four commands and it automatically creates a switch peer group for those particular 3850 switches it creates a mesh network automatically you need not to go ahead and do any mesh configuration and it forms a switch peer group which is a kind of a block so what we assume and recommend as of today for switch peer group switch peer group could be a entire building or maybe a floor of that particular building so it's just uh, the group wherein you assume that a lot of roams will be happening for the clients maybe there are two floors wherein a lot of roaming happens for the clients people go come up or go down there you can create a switch peer group which would help you to have fast roaming between that particular switch itself 
Now, as I told you earlier, MC, MA, and mobility group functionality all exist in today's controller. It could be a 4400, 5500, or a Wizen 2s. Now, just to point out here that 3850 is compatible with 5500 and Wizen 2s uh, existing controllers. So you just need to upgrade the software on these particular uh, controllers, and you can run 3850 within the same architecture. Now let's look at the converged access deployment overview. So again, I have the core distribution or the access layer. This is where I'm going to uh, you know, describe you that where the SPG exists, where the mobility domain exists, where the mobility oracle exists. So you have multiple 3850 switch. There are clients connected to it. There are access points directly connecting to the 3850, which means now the cap up tunnel for these access points will be locally terminating at the 3850 level, which is at the access layer. Now you have the MA functionality running on these switches, which you can wherein you can form an SPG, which I told you earlier that it could be a, a building, it could be a floor in a building, or it could be two floors in a building, depending on your network scenarios. You have MC uh, functionality running on a WLAN controller, which could be a 5760, 5500, or a Wizen 2 at the data center level. Now, this forms a subdomain. So when you have a MC and SPGs, it forms a subdomain for you. Now, there are, uh, you know, scalability numbers available with us that how many SPGs can exist in an, with an MC, or maybe how many subdomain can exist uh, together. So that numbers are available on the Cisco website. And we have formed a mobility group between these mobility controller for enabling fast roaming. And then you have the mobility domain overlooking the entire setup. So uh, just to explain mobility oracle out here, it, it could be referred as a BGP route reflector, uh, wherein the each and every client asks for a route update from the MO only. So for an example, if there's a client roaming across the subdomains, instead of looking at multiple mobility controllers in the network, mobility controller, the relevant mobility controller can go ahead and talk to mobility oracle and get the information for that particular client roaming. So just to explain one more process here, MA maintains the entire database of the locally served clients and that particular database is replicated with MC uh, to the directly connected MC and multiple MCs replicate that particular database with the mobility oracle. So it's a single point of contact for multiple mobility controllers to get the information of a client who's roaming across the subdomains. And of course, you have ICE and PI as a security, port, uh, security portfolio suite and a management suite within your network. Now let's look at the converged access traffic flows and roaming. So uh, out here, I'm just going to take some two or three minutes, and uh, then we are over with our presentation. Uh, this is where, you know, uh, again, I'm going to depict the same example that I took with uh, the current wireless deployment. Uh, we have Wizen 2s, 5508 or 5760 WLAN controllers in your network at the core level. And there's a wireless IP phone trying to call the wired IP phone. Now, if you look at, with, uh, look at the scenario with 3850, what we're doing is we are actually dropping down the MA functionality at the switch level, which is at the access layer. Now, when the access points are connect, connecting to the 3850, which means now the cap app tunnel is locally terminating. Now, if this particular wireless IP phone tries to call the wired IP phone, the traffic will be locally switched, which means now the entire traffic is not going to the data center level. Why? The reason is just one, that the cap app tunnel is terminating, and this is the point where the wired world sees the wireless traffic. Now, just to you know, do a simple communication. It took one hop for with 3850. The other beauty is that now you just have to maintain the policies for both wired and wireless onto a same point, which is at the 3850 level. So it brings down a lot of complexity. Uh, it brings down the investment which is made onto the manners. So you just have a single point, and the entire stuff can be handled by the prime infrastructure or the ICE offered by Cisco as of today. Now, the second example I wanted to depict here is that if this particular wireless IP phone is roaming across the network or maybe in the same switch peer group uh, to a different access point, how does the traffic flow happens? 
Now the traffic flow happen would be from the foreign controller, which is the foreign access point, to the anchor access point, a switch, and then to the wired world. Again, if you look at in this particular scenario, it only took three hops to communicate over the same SPG group. And you retain the same converged policies for both wired and wireless. Now this is where, uh, this is the last slide that I wanted to show you. So uh, how does 3850 fit in, in your network? So if you already have a wireless network, you can still retain those WLAN controllers, which could be a 5508 or a WISEM2, upgrade the software to 11.7 version, and then you can have both 3850 and as well as your prior investment, which was made on 3750, exist in the same network. So what you can do is you can actually, you know, run 3850 as an MC or an MN, depending on the design of your network. If you have a small branch wherein you want to have high redundancy in, the, in terms of wireless, you can still run MC and MA process there. Or what you can do is you can only shift MA process to 3850 in a campus environment and still retain MC process in, at the uh, WLAN controller. So in this scenario, your 3750X, which is will be still be able to communicate with the WLAN controller, which would be running MC and MA process for 3750X. For 3850, the MA process will be localized. Only the MC process will be running at the WLAN controller level. So this is how you can actually, you know, uh, coexist with newer architecture as well as with the older architecture in your environment. So that's it from my side. Uh, if we have time, I'm open for the question. Thanks very much, Nitin. Extremely you, powerful, full of functionality. So thanks very much. Great presentation. We do have a couple of questions, actually. Um, uh, one question is, which access points work with the 3850? So uh, for today, uh, the only N-enabled, uh, you know, A22.11N-enabled access points are compatible with 3850 switches. Mm -hmm. And we are working with the newer releases. We'll be able to, you know, uh, make most uh, access point compatible. But as of today at FCS, only A22.11N access point from Cisco are compatible with 3850. The configure, is it command line or is it a GUI? OK, so uh, as of today, with 3850, it's only CLI. But there is a mid-release that we're releasing in uh, April, this month only which will have the GUI of 3850 uh, for wireless and wired world. Uh, but, you know, I would like to, you know, just clear out the expectation. It's not going to be exactly the same what we had on the older WLAN controllers. The reason only is behind this is that it has a newer iOS XE architecture, the, uh, you know, and because of which the GUI will not be similar to what we had on the WLAN controllers before this. So GUI is totally new. It has all the wizard functionalities and kind of an a la carte functionality as well. So if you want to configure wireless and wired through wizard, you can go ahead and do that. It's very easy. I have personally tested that because I was personally working on the GUI for 3850. And it, as of now, it's currently running in my um, own test setup. So if you guys have, you know, Good comments about it. I am the person, if you guys have the bad com comments on the GUI when it is launched, I am the person for that. Uh, oh, yeah. Can't the wireless configuration be managed from NCS, for example, the SSID? So if you are particularly talking about 3850, uh, it cannot be managed by NCS as of today. Uh, the reason only is that this has a different iOS architecture, which is not understood by the NCS. So Cisco Prime is the, uh, you know, future roadmap for the NCS, uh, you know, the LMS and everything is merging into Cisco Prime 2.0. So if you have NCS, uh, please upgrade to Cisco Prime and you'll have the entire wired and wireless configuration troubleshooting feature sets available for 3850. So, okay, the second question is that are the 3750, uh, 3750 compatible, 3850 stackable only meaning if I use 3750 3750 as a pass-through connected to 3850, would the 3850 see the 3750? Yes. So if you have a 3750X and you're using an uplink port to connect a 3850, uh, that will be, you know, the both will be able to communicate. But you cannot stack them through a stack cable to each other. That's the only difference. Okay. 
Again, Nitin, thank you again for, for presenting today. Uh, we will make the, uh, the webinar recording available and we will let everyone know when it's up uh, online. But uh, thank you again for attending. If anyone is interested in uh, live action and want to test drive it, please download it at the uh, actionpack.com slash live action download. So um, thanks again, everyone. Have a great weekend and uh, have an action-packed day. We'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you.